today we're really about the rule of law cafes uh, that is run across the world. Um, in LexisNexis South Africa, our vision is to really enhance the potential of the African continent. We believe that it is time for Africa to take uh, her uh, rightful position on the global stage. Uh, and one of the ways that we're able to really help the continent achieve its potential is by advancing the rule of law. Uh, and everything that sits under that. So that's a huge focus uh, for us in LexisNexis South Africa. Oh dear, I cannot seem to change. Oh. Just a few stats uh, around who is LexisNexis um, in, in South Africa as well. LexisNexis is part of a, a larger group called the Relix Group. Uh, we're a global provider of information. Uh, the Relix Group has more than, uh, has serve customers and has entities in more than 180 countries around the world uh, with more than 30,000 employees worldwide. So a real global force to be uh, reckoned with. And through our reputation, uh, and one of the magic things that comes with LexisNexis is the local entrepreneurial expertise that hopefully many of you have had the opportunity to deal with. We have really become a trusted partner uh, to many of our customers and companies and professionals. And we have been in the South African landscape for over 85 years. So we've really, um, you know, we've paid our dues uh, and it's time to give back as well, which we have been doing for many years. Uh, we are evolving as a company into something more of a legal technology company versus a pure legal company of the past. And that obviously means uh, a lot of change, but also a lot of opportunity uh, that comes with it for our customers as well as our stakeholders across the continent. So why are we here today? Really, um, you know, we're, we're, we have a vision, we really do, uh, which is about uh, helping Africa explore and achieve its potential. But we also understand that it's all about partnerships. Um, and we really want to build an ecosystem that helps us achieve this vision. So we're looking for people that share our vision for like-minded people, like-minded companies uh, that really help us position Africa to become more competitive at the end of the day. Um, and, and advancing the rule of law means we're really working um, quite tirelessly, I must say, to bring the percentage of people living outside of the protection of the rule of law in Africa down to zero. And we do this through in our everyday business operations, as well as the products and services that we bring to market, but also through our actions as a responsible corporate citizen. Um, like I said, looking for like-minded uh, stakeholders, we have established many partnerships uh, with stakeholders that really spans across governments, academics, um, and, and, and you know, NGOs, the judiciaries, publishers, etc. And this does enable us to deliver on our goal to create a firm foundation. Um, however, like I said, really looking for those partnerships that help us take this forward uh, with much more, um, I would say, speed uh, and agility as we, uh, you know, walk this path. Um, LexisNexis has been here, like I said, for more than 85 years. And so in the beginnings where we were a legal publisher, uh, you know, we were very intimately involved uh, with the legal industry and we still are. That is something that will always be close to our hearts and it is something that we will always have at the core of what we do. But as I said, we really have evolved. And as we evolve, we want to create a bigger impact uh, with the work that we do. And so, on the next slide, I'm not going to go through all of it, don't worry. Uh, it just kind of highlights some of the, you know, the work that we've done in South Africa and, and also across the continent in some instances in terms of uh, really bringing the rule of law to bear uh, across the continent. Uh, and you'll see, you know, many strategic partnerships that have helped us uh, create a lot of impact working with uh, the Attorneys Development Fund, uh, the Women's Legal Center, many pro, uh, the pro bono.org, uh, and many other uh, associations, institutions, and uh, groups that have allowed us to collaborate and reach further than if we had gone it alone. Um, when we look at our rule of law programs, we've been very honored uh, to work closely with the likes of 
Professor Tuli Madonsela, um, and, and she will speak a little bit more about that uh, in her talk today as well. And so, yes, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of it. I think one of the things that it is always important to um, what you do at home is also important, uh, you know, versus just what we put out there. So even from an internal perspective, we've hosted uh, national rule of law masterclasses with Professor Marincella at the LexisNexis offices in Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town because our people rehiring them um, and making sure that we give them the platform and as we all know i mean COVID 19 is no uh is no stranger to any of us but as a global company we do have a responsibility to ensure that uh, we're able to bring our resources to bear especially when we have challenging times like we do currently and so launching our COVID 19 free resource center really was one of the highlights during the last couple of months where we were able to uh, inform the public of their rights and responsibilities uh, during the period as well as the rights and obligations of employers and employees and businesses um, and we got a lot of accolades uh, around the work that was done by LexisNexis and our teams on the ground to ensure that this information was timelessly available uh, and very relevant and also very accurate. It, it enabled many of our stakeholders to make uh, a lot of decisions quite uh, timelessly in order to ensure that the impact was lessened uh, when it was uh, a negative impact and also able to make decisions that assisted companies um, to ensure that they were on the right side of the law. Uh, we also offered access to our online legal services library, which is a state of the art uh, library to and practical guidance uh, to all uh, legal uh, professionals across South Africa, uh, free of charge uh, for the period. And this was also very well uh, applauded um, and also was of a huge help to many of our customers as well as um, uh, to potential customers. So really today is about creating a dialogue um, to, in order to um, give you context as to why the rule of law is important to us across the continent and also to really invite you to reach out uh, and really help us create an ecosystem which we can move, uh, we can use to move forward uh, and ensure that, as I said before, Africa takes her place on the global stage. Um, and, you know, as I said before, this cannot be achieved in, in isolation. We do require an ecosystem to do this. Um, and we're looking for like-minded partners uh, to help us walk this path. Um, and so basically, that's why we're here today. Um, and I don't want to take up too much of time because I really think the magic uh, of all of this lies in the sharing and the dialogue uh, and the learning that we will have um, as we move forward. So without any further ado, uh, let me introduce to you Marcia Balistiano, who is the Director of uh, Corporate Responsibility for Relix. LexisNexis South Africa is part of the Relix group. Marcia is incredibly passionate uh, about the work that she does around the rule of law and she does this across the world. Her team and her work tirelessly for us and they have quite audacious goals, I would say, in terms of working to ensure that uh, Relix becomes the, the worldwide leader in the space. So speaking to Marcia, Marcia uh, really brings to the fore the passion that she brings uh, and also the structure uh, that she has put in place in order for us to really be able to achieve our goals around advancing the rule of law worldwide, but also many other elements around the corporate responsibility um, portfolio for Relix. So, Marcia, if I could hand over to you. Thank you, Fadesha. This is just such an honor to participate today. And I am mostly learning from all of you and looking forward to listening to the discussion. Let me just say that what we mean by corporate responsibility is maximizing the positive impact of our business on society through what we call our unique contributions 
as a business. So today you'll hear a lot um, just in general uh, today in, in the widest meaning of that term around the purpose of a company. And it's been very important for us to soul search and think about what that means for our company. Um, as Fadesh just said, we're a global business up around 33,000 people, and we're operating in 40 countries around the world, including with a strong presence in South Africa. And we think about how we can positively impact society indeed through those unique contributions. So that includes promoting the rule of law and access to justice. It also means furthering uh, access to health and improving science through Elsevier, which is one of our for business segments. We also have a big data business, um, which is LexisNexis Risk Solutions. And then we have a business suite exhibitions, which is one of the world's largest events companies. And we think about their unique contribution as bringing uh, people together using the convening power to foster communities um, and, and to improve the efficiency of markets. And that also picks up the business to business uh, websites and tools and publications that we have, which is part of our risk and business analytics division, which includes risk solutions. So it's a, it's a big company, um, not as big as, as um, Jonathan, your company, I think, but, um, but, but big enough. Um, and we've been thinking about this agenda for, for quite a while. And indeed, as Vidasha said, the rule of law is really part of what our contribution is through our legal products and services. And I have a quote from the CEO, Mike Walsh, who was recognized last year by the United Nations Foundation for his work as a champion on the rule of law. He says that LexisNexis is a special place to work because our people can see the clear connection between advancing the rule of law and creating a better society. In my own work, I was saying to Videsha the other day, I kind of think of myself as the conscience of our company, but corporate responsibility is not owned by me, it's not owned by my excellent team, it's owned by all of those 33,000 people, including a number of colleagues from LexisNexis South Africa who are, are participating today. So it's, it's each one of us and it's working to uh, motivate and to also hold ourselves to account by putting objectives in the public domain so that we are being transparent to our stakeholders about the things we care about and the things that we know we need to do a better job on. So I think we think about corporate responsibility in three areas in terms of our activities. We need to have our own house in order. And as it relates to the rule of law, we need to make sure that we have, for example, good governance, that we are respecting human rights in how we are employing people and developing them. It also means that we need to be setting um, specific objectives around the rule of law and access to justice, that unique contribution of RELX. And today is a good example of that. If you go to uh, RELX.com, so www.RELX.com, you'll see corporate responsibility is one of our main navigational tabs and corporate responsibility is something within there. And you can see that under unique contributions, we have articulated that we want to expand these rule of law cafes that we began in London, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's also about advocacy. So it's having our own house in order, progressing our unique contributions, and advocating. And as it relates to the rule of law and access to justice, I'm going to give you an example. But on um, that uh, background of setting up the rule of law cafes, I guess for me personally, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I wish I was because I have so much admiration for the legal community. They're some of the smartest people I know. Um, they have to be able to process information. They have to be able to research and deliver the best results um, as both lawyers and members of the judiciary for those that they serve. But I think that 
it's incumbent on, on all representatives of business, even if they are not part of the legal team, to be understanding what the legal frameworks are for the, the rule of law and to understand what that means practically and how they can advance that in their business. So you saw Vidisha showed a slide. It can be a very lofty concept. What does the rule of law mean? But as Vidisha showed, it's really an umbrella concept. It really is the foundation for everything else. And it's also the foundation for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These were adopted by every nation of the world in 2015. And if we just remind ourselves what some of these are, and um, yesterday we had a very exciting event, our uh, SDG Inspiration Day, and we'll be making uh, video content available from the SDG Resource Center. This is a free tool that we launched in 2017 for the world. It, so if you look at um, SDG Resources, sdgresources.relex.com. You'll see that we have over a thousand content sources on the site from across our business and also from uh, key partners, including from within the UN system. But the 17 SDGs are things like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well being, quality education, um, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable. Um, and clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have the rule of law, you cannot achieve any of those. It's a real um, platform on which to build the houses that we seek to build. So it's essential. And when I was thinking with my colleagues, you know, for those of us that aren't lawyers, what can we do to support our colleagues in LexisNexis? We thought, well, if we, if we call it a cafe, and we serve nice pastries. Hopefully you are um, comfortably sitting and have uh, uh, nice uh, refreshments and things to enjoy, then they will come. And so we've been holding these now for almost three years and it's been a really great way for us to bring uh, members of the Bar Association, from the Law Society, from uh, peer companies like Jonathan's um, and NGOs that, like Katrina, um, represents and bring us all together to, to just talk about what does the rule of law mean to us and then how can we support each other in advancing the rule of law. So I wanted to give just some examples of how we've tried to do that over the last um, year within our business and then also to talk, come back to that bit about advocacy for a moment, and then to uh, ask for your help on something. So some examples in 2019 on how we were trying to advance the rule of law. Our colleagues at LexisNexis made 10 laws relating to families, uh, women and children, and sexual abuse in the Maldives. Uh, they translated that from uh, Devehi and forgive my uh, pronunciation, into English. And they also created a plain language version for distribution by the Maldives Family Legal Clinic. Um, my colleagues in Southeast Asia, in uh, Malaysia, and also in Singapore have been supporting mobile court projects, not only in Malaysia, but also in Myanmar to support villagers with their legal rights in cases on statelessness, land uh, issues and native rights. Uh, we collaborated with the Global Investigative Journalism Network to put low cost news and research in tools in the hands of over two dozen investigative uh, journalists in 10 countries to help them write investigative articles on anti-corruption and other topics. And um, closer to your home, in on the African continent, we worked with the Supreme Court of Sierra Leone to scan laws available in only one set of books for use by judges across Sierra Leone. We also uh, donated um, uh, to legal aid in Sierra Leone to enhance the capacity of legal and um, aid lawyers, enabling them to better support their clients. Now, in terms of the advocacy piece that I mentioned, 
Um, Relics is an early signatory of the United Nations Global Compact, and I would encourage all of those that are involved with companies today to, if you're not already a signatory, to get involved and sign up to the Global Compact. There are over 10,000 corporate signatories um, around the world, but there are also representatives of civil society, and it's the best that we have in terms of incorporating the 10 principles of the Global Compact into our business. So those 10 principles relate to human rights, to labor, to environment, and anti-bribery. And we have embedded those 10 principles into our code of conduct and also into our supplier code of conduct. And we are constantly thinking about how we can support their various initiatives. One of them relates to SDG 16, which is um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So SDG 16, there's an action platform of the Global Compact that we've been involved with. And what they are trying to do is really mobilize business um, and the legal community to create a framework and practical guidance, not only for the legal officers within companies, but rank and file members of companies like myself to help us all understand what it means and what they can do within their own organizations to support the rule of law. Now, I said that I would end with a request to you. Um, we've been trying to get a project off the ground over a few years now, and um, it's an African tax law codification project. So we know that taxes provide governments with essential revenue necessary for a range of public services that benefit their citizens. So governments need codified tax laws to know when, how, and from whom they should be collecting. And without tax taxes, we don't have any of the public services that we need, such as law enforcement, or we don't have schools, or basic infrastructure. So it's, it's really an important element of, of the rule of law. So citizens need codified and transparent tax laws to understand their liabilities, to make sure that they're fair, and to also um, ensure that there is fair collection and use of their tax remittances. So our, our tax team at Relix really believes that there needs to be a rule of law related to tax. And uh, we've been working with our colleagues um, in South Africa to try and identify a number of African countries that have no publicly available um, or up-to-date and consolidated tax law available to both the tax authorities and to taxpayers. So we've been just trying to discuss with um, the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, on developing a shortlist of countries for a proof of concept, which we had been planning to really accelerate this year. But um, as Vidasha mentioned, we are all around the world facing an unprecedented situation uh, with COVID-19. So it's been delayed, I would imagine, um, in what we were hoping to advance this year. But that doesn't mean that we can't be doing all the desk-based things that we can. So if any of you can help, with our interest in advancing this rule of tax law project, please do reach out or um, you know, put something into the chat function or let Fidesha and the colleagues know in South Africa and we can make sure that, that we are in touch. I mean, just maybe uh, two final things in closing. Um, as I mentioned, coming back to being um, worried always um, and never satisfied with having that our own house in order that we need to continue to raise the bar we also um, in regard to our rule of tax law need to be a responsible taxpayer and so um, we work um, on making sure that our um, ways that we pay tax and what we pay is transparent um, we have tax principles which are available um, from uh, relics.com, our corporate website. So it really kind of goes hand in hand how we conduct our business, um, ensuring that we try and maximize our positive impact on society 
and then also that we advocate well in the wider world. So in closing, I will just point out that um, as you saw on Vidasha's slide, our colleagues at LexisNexis are doing some very important work to support businesses and really anyone um, during COVID-19 as it relates to legal information. And we also have uh, consolidated our response to COVID-19, which you can see on the SDG Resource Center. So again, um, that's sdg.resources.relics.com. And you can see as one of the key sections on the landing page, our coronavirus resources. And I've had the good fortune to uh, work on a podcast series where I've been able to talk to a range of thought leaders from within our business, but um, in the wider world uh, as well about COVID-19 and its impact on the SDGs. So um, in a spare moment, please check out some of those interviews. Videsha, thank you so much for this opportunity to you and all the colleagues and it's been a real pleasure and I'm going to be listening with interest and as I said at the beginning of my remarks, trying to learn as much as possible about what's happening on the amazing continent of Africa, but also within South Africa. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you for your support and the passion that you've shown us in terms of leading the way as we uh, move forward on this new journey around the Rule of Law Cafe. So. I know that you've been working a lot with Katrina. Um, so can I maybe ask you to do a quick uh, introduction to Katrina uh, so that she can share with us some of the amazing work that uh, she's been doing uh, as well as what Jonathan's been doing um, so that we can oh, share. Absolutely. That'd be more than 15 years now. Katrina showed me the ropes when she she actually was a LexisNexis legal colleague, and uh, Katrina does not do things by halves. Um, she leads by example. Uh, she comes with um, great uh, chops, and as it were, as a barrister, so she knows the law, um, but she also is passionate about making a difference, and uh, she worked for many years uh, at LexisNexis, but became very involved with an uh, initiative that she helped to start the International Law Book Facility, which she now leads, which is a really brilliant idea about helping law firms that are using legal texts, who are updating those legal texts. And yes, so much is delivered online, but the legal community still wants to be able to uh, refer to texts as well. So when they are updated, making sure that they find a home, uh, particularly across Sub-Saharan Africa. And she's been doing this not only for the International Law Facility, but she was a driving force behind our longest standing community partner at Relex, Book Aid International, which brings uh, books to the developing world. So uh, Katrina, it's been a real pleasure and um, honor to work with you. So I'm going to cede the virtual floor to you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Marcia, for your kind words. Um, <clears throat> and thank you very much, Videsha, Nelly and Sibu for inviting me to the, the first Business for the Rule of Law Cafe in South Africa. And it's, it's great to have the chance to talk to everybody. <clears throat> Jonathan is, is driving the slides for me. So I think when I stick my thumb up, Jonathan, that will be the next one to go to. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about the International Law Book Facility. Um, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary this year, which is very exciting. We've so far in, in 15 years, we've sent 65,000 books to over 190 organizations in 53 countries. Um, and 24 of those countries are in Africa. And you can see from the, the photos on the screen, the sort of the range of organizations. There's just a, just a sample in the last um, four years, the range of organizations that we send the books to from practitioners to judges, students, law teachers, prisoners, prison officers, um, uh, just the whole range of the legal infrastructure structure receives the books from the, um, the, the International Law Book Facility. Um, <clears throat> the idea for the charity came from Lord Thomas of Cungeth, who is a the most recent, re recently retired Lord Chief Justice in the UK, in, in England and Wales. 
And he met with Ugandan judges in 2002 and learned from them that they didn't have access to up-to-date texts. And for them, they, they explained that that was, that was really creating a barrier for them to, to deliver justice in the cases that they were hearing. And Lord Thomas knew about the fact that a lot of law firms and barristers' chambers and courts get rid of texts when, they do, when the next edition comes along um, and thought, well, it's crazy. We're, all these books might be going to landfill. Can we just, can we use them somehow? So that's where the idea for the charity came and we've been growing ever since. Um, we've shipped across the world from the smallest jurisdictions to the largest. So the smallest would be Nepal, Nauru, Micronesia, St. Kitts and Nevis, as an example, through to the largest in Africa and Asia, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, South Africa, and, and Tanzania. You like to move on, Jonathan? <laughs> Thank you very much. So our, our mission is to support the rule of law through sharing legal knowledge. It's a very simple mission. It's a very simple activity that we do. We take books donated by law firms, barristers, chambers, and so forth, courts, and we repurpose them and ship them to organisations who apply to us for books and tell us what they would like. And it's, it's essentially a simple act of recycling that stops all those books going into landfill. And consequently, we are supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goal 16 that Marcy was telling you about just now to promote peace, justice and strong institutions and to, to, to help by through sharing legal knowledge, giving lawyers and judges access to information. We partner with a lot of other organisations to further their rule of law programmes. For example, the, pro bonos, the Sierra Leone Pro Bono Network, Junior Lawyers Against Poverty, Role UK, the Foreign Office in the UK, um, the, the UK's Judicial Office, who do a lot of judicial college, who do a lot of international training, Justice Defenders, um, who were formerly, until quite recently, known as African Prison Project. In fact, our most recent books arrived just yesterday at, um, in Uganda, which despite coronavirus, which was very exciting for us to see the books coming off the, out, of the, out of the lorries being um, taken into the, the, the uh, Justice Defenders offices. And we also partner with in-house legal teams. In fact, only one in-house legal team, which is Anglo-American and De Beers. And I will be telling you a bit more about that shortly. And we also have growing relationships with UK universities. So getting students, getting the lawyers of the future involved in collecting up their books and packing them and for particular uh, shipments. And we'll tell you a little bit more about the Nottingham students who helped us very much with the, the, uh, the shipment to Sierra Leone and Zimbabwe. And you can see that quote on the, <coughs> sorry, Jonathan, the quote from Lord Thomas, which still holds true today, that you, you, can't, you can't succeed um, his, his words, no judiciary can accomplish the task of, 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 of access to justice um, without the help of lawyers who have access to good libraries and good libraries themselves. So really reinforcing this important point about access to information, because no one lawyer holds all the knowledge that they need in their heads at one time. They need access to libraries. So who are we? We are <clears throat> run by eight trustees who include um, a recently appointed Court of Appeal judge, Lord Justice Dingermans, and a High Court judge, Mr Justice Picken, um, and a number of partners from large law firms in, in London. Lord Thomas continues as a very involved patron, and also Christian Fleck, who is MD of LexisNexis in the UK, is one of our very supportive pa patrons. That's the sort of structure, the, the governance structure, and then it's, everything else is done by, by me and, and volunteers. <clears throat> a little bit about our, our impact. You can read those, those bullet points for yourself, but essentially um, English law provides a useful point of comparison for other jurisdictions, both common law and civil law, and, and many countries share the same legal principles as, as English law principles. Um, <clears throat> the organisations we support don't usually don't have enough funding to replenish and restock their libraries, and in some cases they don't have a library at all. We're just about to send books to the Turks and Caicos Islands of the Supreme Court there. They have no library. The judges have no library at all. They've set aside a space for one, and they're, they're obviously hope, we're hoping to be able to supply them with books as and where coronavirus restrictions enable us to do that. <clears throat> We've recently supported libraries in Iraq, who, which were sadly destroyed by um, Daesh. Um, and so a large part of our work is not just assisting those countries who are re building new libraries, but to build to, and, and, re and replenish re destroyed libraries. So that's a very much an ongoing, whether it's 
through civil war or even um, <clears throat> natural disaster, like the floods and typhoons that can sweep through the, the Caribbean. And we're very, very pleased to have helped um, <clears throat> the South African Litigation Centre in South Africa. That's an example of a, a great human rights organisation um, and also Zimbabwe and DR, D, the DRC. So just a few more pictures of, of some of our impacts in Ethiopia in 2018. Papua New Guinea, <clears throat> again in 2018, we worked with the Chief Justice of Papua Guinea, New Guinea. He was keen to set up, a, 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 to replenish and restock his library in Port Moresby. And there's a photo there of the High Commissioner for the, from the UK handing over the books to the, the Chief Justice. And then at the bottom, the picture of the Southern Africa Litigation Centre and a very nice quote from their Executive Director about the impact of the books on them. You can move along. A couple more examples, and the Kenya National Council for Law Reporting. Law reporters need access to the full range of law reports so that if a judge refers to a case, they can include an accurate reference to that case and check the details of the case. And there's often a dialogue between law reporters and judges to make sure that the, 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 <clears throat> the citations are correct. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes with, with law reporting, as I know from my, my life at LexisNexis. Um, we were delighted to support the Kenya National Council for Law Reporting with a actually a huge donation who came from, which came from a retiring judge in the UK who donated her entire set of English law reports. And they found, eventually found their way to, to Kenya, which was great. And then the next slide is, <clears throat> just shows a couple of examples of shipments to Tanzania <clears throat> in 2019 and, and most recently in 2020. And you can see from the photo that the <clears throat> recipients of the books at the law school there with their face masks because they were doing this all in the, the time of COVID. And they very kindly acted as the distributor, not just for the law school, but also for the Institute of Judicial Administration in Tanzania and the East African Court of Justice. So I was very grateful to the law school for helping us with that distribution. We have a, <clears throat> a large shipment on its way to the African Court in Arusha as well, which, um, which actually had just arrived in the last few weeks. We're just waiting for those books to get on the shelves. So <clears throat> for the future, we we are, are obviously we want to continue to meet the demand for books. We have applications from all over the world, which we're doing our best to 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 meet. At this time, we're not able to pack books, but I have a cunning plan, <clears throat> which I'm hope won't say too much about. What I'm hoping will come to fruition over the next couple of weeks to get books packed up and and shipped out. And so we want to continue to build our work with the UK legal com community. Um, to build up reserves of high quality relevant legal texts and there's certainly no, no shortage of those, particularly with lots of court closures in the UK with the rationalisation of the court system. We want to continue to build partnerships with organisations who also support the rule of law both internationally and, and the UK and that includes <clears throat> working closely with Anglo-American and De Beers on our third project um, and to engage the next generation of lawyers to carry on this work and hopefully with, with the idea of building informal mentoring between Used to, between the students, so the students in, for example, Sierra Leone, talking to the students in, in, at Nottingham University, and they can share their experiences about what it's like to be a law student and to enter the world of the legal profession. So that, I think that's, that's me. Um, let me finish. So thank you very much for do, doing the forwarding, Jonathan. I shall hand over to Jonathan now. Thank you, Katrina, and good morning all. And I suspect that's the last time I'll be allowed to drive slides for you. <laughs> Apologies if I went ahead of it. Um, my name is Jonathan Hock and I'm the Head of Legal Commercial for Anglo-American and I'm currently based in London. Uh, I've been with the group for 22 years, uh, joined, having joined in South Africa where I trained and qualified and I transferred to London about 13 years ago. I, I am a big fan of the Rule of Law Cafe. Um, I, I attended, I think, one of the first meetings uh, with Helen Shepherd uh, of the team in London and uh, it, it is one of those areas that I feel very passionately about. Um, as Marsha mentioned, it is really the underpin for all of these sustainable development goals. And without a strong, stable system, a strong set of rule of law advocates, um, one is never going to achieve any of the other objectives, I don't believe. So um, now I've got to drive my own slides. <laughs> Um, so I, in, in order to give context to the partnership we've established with the Inter International Law Facility, I thought it was important to give a bit of a view as to Anglo-American 
what we stand for, the journey we've been on, and the recent initiative that I've been very proud to become part of, which is known as the Ambassadors for Good Program. Uh, and then Katrina and I will tag team in terms of our cooperation in respect of that project, uh, which we've entitled the Rule of Law Ambassadors. So uh, Anglo-American is probably better known in South African market than on the global stage, but we have taken a number of steps to re-establish ourselves as a leading mining company and develop a portfolio of world-class mining operations and resources. And we do look to develop uh, innovative practices and technologies to discover new resources, develop mine and move products to our customers globally. We have a large international footprint, and I'll talk to that a little bit later, and that's been part of the benefit we've been able to use in working with uh, Katrina and the team at the ILBF. Um, we recognize the importance of um, working with business partners and diverse stakeholders to unlock value sustainably from our mineral resources, which include diamonds, platinum, copper, iron ore, coal, nickel, manganese, and most recently through our acquisition of Ceres Minerals in the UK, which is a polyhalide project, uh, crop nutrients. Again, that's part of the, the sustainable journey we're on and, and being able to support in terms of uh, supplying nutrients for food to develop food products. We have a long history and it stretches back over 100 years now, um, spanning several continents. And in 2017, we celebrated our centenary. Uh, Anglo-American's founder, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, said many years ago that the aims of the group have been and will remain to earn profits, but to earn them in a way as to make a real and permanent contribution to the well-being of Southern Africa. This principle of creating lasting, sustainable value for all of our stakeholders guides the way we conduct our business and has certainly been further enhanced through the recognition of the need for a social license to operate. We have defined our purpose as being to reimagine mining to improve people's lives. And this is at the heart of everything we do. It plays an important role as a constant for all of our employees and our external stakeholders about the role we can play in society. A recent example of this has been our response to COVID-19, which has included partnering with UN Women to provide supplies to safe houses and communities where there have been increases in domestic abuse, providing PPE and medical supplies and testing equipment to communities where we operate, in fact, this has become a pivot in terms of our general operations. We're a mining company, but we have a team of supply chain professionals and legal, uh, uh, principally from our, actually our South African team, who have become expert in the requirements of importing and supplying medical equipment. This is definitely not part of what a mining company would typically be engaging in, but it is something that just we recognize is part of the role we play in society. We've also provided accommodation to healthcare professionals, provided food and security and essential services um, to, to our communities. And we've implemented a matched giving program, which is also aimed at supporting financially where the need is required. But those are just a few of the things we've been doing in that space. We also are combining smart innovation with the utmost consideration for our people, the communities, and recognizing that role we play in host countries where we operate. In terms of our strategy, on this slide, I'll just talk to two points. We have a future smart mining proposition, which wraps in as a key differentiator in the way we conduct our business, a sustainable mining plan, and also recognizes the value of partnerships and our license to operate. Where we operate? That's um, the map, obviously, of where we have operations. It doesn't include areas where we have um, exploration projects that would pick up Zambia. Angola, Ecuador, and Greenland. Um, a number of those jurisdictions have some challenges in the rule of law space. And again, this is part of why we feel so strongly about finding ways to support that. It is um, obviously part of a good business principles, good business strategy to have a stable operating environment. And that again, wrapped in the rule of law means if you understand the laws, if they are consistently applied, you know what you can actually proceed to do and how you can manage your way through that and make hopefully the best contribution to a community and a country that one can. Certainly one of the areas where we've picked up some interesting problems um, is Colombia. And that's uh, an area where we've had some interesting constitutional court decisions 
where the uh, Constitutional Court is effectively stepping outside of its court role and has actually taken on an executive role. And we found that that has really introduced some rule of law challenges that we are trying to find a way to uh, influence and address. Um, yeah, and this, the slide also does not show areas where we no longer operate. Um, so we certainly used to have operations in Venezuela uh, and we did look at operations in Russia and for the very specific reason of the, the difficulty of actually being able to conduct business in those areas, the rule of law challenges one faces there, it was recognized that those, those were not areas where you could viably conduct business. So our sustainable mining plan is a holistic integrated approach um, and comprises mutually reinforcing elements that are supposed to develop positively how we transform the operations where we are and how our stakeholders experience our business, both locally and globally. We have three global sustainability pillars. These are becoming a trusted corporate leader, ensuring we have thriving communities and that there is a, cons a recognition of a healthy environment. Each of these encompass stretch goals that we've set ourselves for 2030. Um, and under each of these, there are critical foundations that form the common and minimum requirements for each of our operations and our business as a whole. They are essential to the long-term credibility and success of our plan and to our social license to operate. Uh, our, our, our sustainability plan recognizes the link to the UN's uh, sustainability development goals that Marcia mentioned earlier. And obviously the importance of being a trusted corporate leader involves recognizing accountability, but also policy advocacy and actually making an impact and then speaking up when it is important to do so in the support of peace, justice and strong institutions. I want to focus on two slide elements on this slide. So, as I mentioned, policy advocacy is one of our key related stretch goals. And that is where we are now taking an active approach to reporting on what we are doing in the space. And obviously, we also are supporting education. And this is an area where I believe we are making an a difference. And in, we partnered with the South Africa's Department of Basic Education in 2018 to launch the Anglo-American Education Programme. It takes a systemic approach to improving reading, writing, and numeracy levels. Partnership plays a central role in meeting our targets for education in South Africa. It currently covers 110 schools and is growing. It's something I feel particularly passionately about as well. Again, to ensure that you have educated lawyers, judges, you need to ensure you have the right level of education through the ecosystem. Moving on to the Ambassadors for Good program. This was launched in 2018, and it borrows from an idea which germinated at operations in Chile. So it's part of the benefit of being a global organization, is being able to take the best from the jurisdictions in which we operate. It's an employee volunteering program, and it draws on the employee's talents and passion to bring about, our, 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 give effect to our purpose, and the value to life in the communities, give back value to life in the communities where we live and work. Our funding from the Anglo-American Foundation Suitable partners are able to qualify for grants under the scheme. As I said, started off in the UK and South Africa, but, um, and there were 72 projects in, in the first year. That to me was a real significant indication of how important it was to have a program like this and how easy in fact it was to get support um, from the employees in terms of things they felt strongly about. The initial projects included uh, establishing community gardens, support for youth football, researching human rights in the shipping sector, and taking an active approach of inspiring engineers and um, encouraging STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and maths in uh, women's and children's school, uh, uh, girls' schools. Um, in, in South Africa, one of our team has um, supported legal clinics in their employee, employee indebtedness assistance. And this has even extended to lobbying for legislative change around employee indebtedness. Today, 228 employees have contributed to five and a half thousand hours working through programs and supported 63 NGOs for the benefit of more than 100,000 people. 
90% of those projects were successfully delivered through the program. To me, it is a real significant feature of what it is to be able to support through the rule of, uh, through the Ambassadors for Good program, the things that the Anglo-American group and its employees feel passionate about. I'll take through the next slides. They just really talk about the process that we go through, how projects are assessed, um, how the grant assessments are done, and then um, um, how that then is uh, put into place to support programs being executed. If, if anybody on the call is interested in further information, we're very happy, either the team in South Africa or in London, to provide further information around that. Um, just to draw out a couple of the features in terms of the evaluation criteria for projects, um, we've so, got a- Jonathan, Jonathan yes. I'm sorry, Vidisha. We do need to please move it along a little bit to make sure that we stay on uh, track of agenda. We'll do so, understood, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly just point to the importance of diversity and selection criteria, as well as uh, aligning with sustainability goals. Moving on to the next slide. So this is where uh, Katrina and I met. So it was through a rule of law cafe in London um, three years ago now, two and a half years ago now that Katrina and I met. Um, I had been to a presentation on the Ambassadors for Good program uh, at Anglo, um, a couple of days before the Rule of Law Cafe, and had thought it, it's a wonderful program, but what can I, as a lawyer, in and sort of working long hours and um, really not having too much contact with communities, do to support the program? So I'd effectively said, I'm interested, but I can't do anything with this. Uh, I then met Katrina, and she, we got chatting, and she mentioned what the International Law Book Facility is aimed at, and I. Penny just dropped that this was really something that we could get behind, that we could support. And um, it, to me, it was really was a no brainer. I went back to the office and spoke to two of my colleagues, Cecilia Ferreira and Andrew Donovan, uh, in the group legal team. And it, it was really one of those areas that just resonated. It was something we felt passionately about, and this was a way we could actually support it. Um, so we worked with Katrina to put together a proposal, and that was approved and successfully implemented. Um, we've been able, with the partnership with the International Law Book Facility, to cover the costs of shipping books through the grant. Um, we've been able to link into uh, representatives in country to support the beneficiaries and provide contacts um, to the ILBA. We've supported by packing textbooks, which is uh, an activity that is more fun than uh, <laughs> it might otherwise appear. Um, and we've been supportive in how we actually uh, arrange for books to be delivered and received in communities um, uh, and handing those books over to the beneficiaries of those. Um, in 2018, um, our first project, we, um, we looked at um, uh, working in Botswana, Namibia, and Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe. And it was a contact with our uh, company secretary and lawyer in Zimbabwe that really unlocked an ability to support a number of beneficiaries in Zimbabwe. And through that, we were able to deliver textbooks to the Greater University of Zimbabwe, Midland State University of Zimbabwe, the Legal Resources Foundations in Zimbabwe. And then through one of Andrew Donovan's contacts in Sierra Leone, uh, the Jam Fair business, um, we were able to support Njala University to, uh, to deliver books uh, to them. Um, and in last year and, and this year, we made a further shipment to Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone, um, helping the Women's University in Africa in Zimbabwe, and a shipment of textbooks donated by a retiring professor from Sheffield University to McKenney University in Sierra Leone. Um, <clears throat> the books arrived uh, and soon, in Sierra Leone as soon as the coronavirus restrictions are lifted, we'll have a bit of a, <clears throat> a formal handover. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, these are some photos of the delivery to Zimbabwe. So 316 boxes were packed and shipped. <clears throat> and they were handed over by the chairman of our Unki Mine operations there, Mr. J.P. Mpoza. And um, in 2019, those are the uh, books that were sent to Sierra Leone. Uh, 213 boxes were packed um, and uh, 21 additional boxes uh, will be delivered to the university. What's next? Um, so in terms of recent contacts, uh, we, I reached out to our team that are doing some exploration work in Zambia. 
And it was amazing to get the sort of positive response when we asked the question as to whether they could help. They were very keen to get involved. And I think that just sort of underscores the importance that even at an early stage like that, people recognize the, the, the value of trying to support uh, rule of law challenged uh, jurisdictions and ensure that there are um, appropriate books delivered that will help support them in hopefully shoring up uh, legal principles there. And <clears throat> we're starting to explore opportunities in Latin America through um, assistance from the lawyers based in South, sorry, South America uh, from the IBA Pro Bono Committee. Uh, uh, I think some key success factors and learnings that have uh, we, uh, struck us as we've been on this journey. Um, so I certainly you've identified that's like Katina Ofti. Uh, so the power of partnership, it's a bit of a truism, but it's worth stating um, what we can achieve together is so much more than we can achieve individually. Um, and this project has proved that for both for the ILBF and for the Anglo-American and De Beers team. I don't think at the start we expected our collaboration to develop as it has and for it to open up so many other opportunities. So that, that's been a fantastic part of this. Exactly. And uh, certainly from our side, it's been e very easy to commit to something passionate that we're passionate about. Um, it has involved a lot of time, um, but it's been something we've been able to and willingly give, uh, even in, in, in personal time. Um, so, and I think something else we found is that getting support for good ideas, for good activities is often easier than you think. When we reached out to the lawyer in Zimbabwe, when we reached out to the discovery team in, in um, Zambia, when we reached out to the contacts in uh, Sierra Leone, it was unconditional support. It was an excitement in actually being able to get behind something that really made sense. And uh, yeah, I think it really just shows that sometimes it is, it is easy to get support where you just ask. Um, and I think really the value of collaboration, uh, the team, Andrew, Cecilia, myself, and um, recently added team member Kimberly, uh, it, it is great to be able to work with like-minded people to find common interests and goals to achieve and uh, certainly working with Katrina has been a real privilege. Uh, <clears throat> from the uh, ILBF side we unlike a lot of much larger global organizations we don't have the benefit of locally based teams so uh, and many of our recipients have never received a big international shipment before so having the support of the Anglo-American and De Beers teams in country has been absolutely invaluable to get as Jonathan was saying earlier about their, their expertise in dealing with uh, logistics, that's been a, a fantastic benefit to us and given us huge peace of mind, but also helped with the feedback loop that we get so that we get the feedback from the recipients about how the books are helping and so forth. And, and from the Anglo side, certainly the, the connections that Katrina has been able to make um, with teams at um, LexisNexis, um, the, the initiative that was mentioned earlier in terms of Sierra Leone, we're looking at more broadly across the group uh, as Anglo-American, uh, working with Richard Honey as a barrister who does work in Sierra Leone and got introduced to Damon Linda Dobbs, who is the first woman black Supreme Judge in the UK. And again, it was just really creating those connections, uh, that, that ecosystem that uh, Videsha talked to earlier that has been to me very critical. And so we'll continue to be supportive of the ILBF and the Rule of Law Cafe. And then just one just, just one last point is, is a critical factor for us is learning from the organizations that we support. So learning from them about what they need, how we can help them and gaining insights into their, into their information needs has been absolutely invaluable. I'll leave you a quote. Change cannot and will not happen overnight, but the intent to evolve will produce opportunities for growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Katrina, showing the impact of partnership um, and I, I guess a shared vision to be um, a change leader across the world, it seems. So thank you for sharing with us the work that you've been doing and also some of the results, because it's always great to see, you know, what's happening. I think it inspires people when we're able to see that what is going on does have impact uh, across continent. So well done and thank you for sharing. 
So next, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Nomonde White. Um, I actually had the pleasure of sharing a stage with Nomonde not too long ago when we were still allowed to be out in the open on stages. Uh, it was part of the Women's Day celebrations in South Africa. And I can tell, with, I can tell you firsthand uh, the amount of passion that I saw just emanating uh, from Nomonde when it comes to empowering and um, enabling women uh, in technology, but across business as well. She is very um, passionate about also creating a pipeline of future leaders. Um, and she is one of those uh, people that really goes the extra mile to ensure that uh, you know, what she does really is impactful as well. So I know that one of her aspirations is to see a lot more women and uh, young professionals, African professionals, taking up senior roles in technology and in the industry. And so this is something she really works uh, a lot uh, towards. Nomonde is uh, the head of governance and reporting for APSA's group APSA Group uh, Engineering Services, which is one of the largest divisions at APSA Group. Um, and she's going to be speaking to us about gender equality and addressing the gender equality uh, in order to uplift society and create mind shifts uh, in a changing world. So I'll hand over to Nomonde. Thank you so much, V. Um, it's such a privilege to be with um, all of you here today. Just before I start my introduction, I just want to explain that I'm, I will be fading to, to black shortly. So my video feed is not going to be on for the duration of my narration. And um, the primary reason for that is I would like to honor the many women who are faceless and voiceless, who are not heard in, in, in a lot of cases. So um, if you could just um, afford me the opportunity to go through my narration without my video. So I'm just going to switch off my um, video feed and I will begin my presentation shortly. Um, again, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It is an immense privilege to be with you here today. As I was preparing for today's session and going through research and literature, it was difficult not to feel triggered in light of the state that the world finds itself in. At a global level, many of us have been heartbroken and angered by the now viral video image of how Mr. George Floyd lost his life at the hands of police brutality in the United States. This incident, of course, led to the massive protest action, not just in the United States, but the world over, because seeing that shook our humanity to the core. Recent events and moments over time necessitates that we do not look at the female experience just in the workplace, um, because that's not only where we exist. Now, bringing this closer to home, from a South African perspective, the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent lockdown that ensued as a result of that has forced us all to come to terms with the deep-rooted issues that have been swept under the carpet for far too long. Sadly, femicide is now an issue, and is certainly not an issue that is unique to South Africa. The face of domestic violence against women is not isolated to one racial group. Domestic violence does not discriminate and provide you with reprieve simply because you are wealthy or poor. Based in London or Guamashu, all women from all corners of the world will experience aspect of this at least once in their lifetime. It may not be directly, but all of us will know the number of women who are either close to us or within our immediate social circles who have experienced some form of abuse. In addition to this, we all know women who have been brutalized or murdered. Many women may look like they are physically alive, but if we took the time to have a closer look, what we'll find is that they died a long time ago and no longer see their worth and value as a result of systemic abuse. I'm not unique in this regard and have my own personal experience with this complex and painful and complicated topic. And I acknowledge that this is an uncomfortable topic for many of us and a topic that I could never do justice to within a 10 minute conversation. As a woman, however, I'm now way past the point of being politely angry. And while preparing for today and reflecting on where we find ourselves with regards to this important topic, I've come to the stark realization that this is now a matter of life and death. We are literally fighting for our survival as women. In an ideal world, I wish that things were different and that I had the freedom to pursue my purpose and ambitions without worrying about whether or not I may be next. Will I be the next topic of a couple of hours of Twitter rage that will eventually lead me to being discussed as a statistic? where I lose my name 
an identity and just become another number. I'm an optimist at heart and as such, I refuse to accept that this will be our narrative as women. And I know that I'm accountable for playing my part in finding a lasting solution for the benefit of future generations. I recognize my privilege in terms of the opportunities I have been afforded throughout my career. And this is not something that I take lightly. Coming from a strong and proud generation of women who were domestic workers and sacrificed the little that they earned to ensure that I had access to opportunities that they were denied. I would therefore like to leverage this privilege in the pursuit of attaining gender equality in my lifetime. With the many problems that we are faced with, it would be disingenuous for us not to recognize the small wins and the concerted efforts that have been made thus far in the quest of attaining gender equality. The women of this generation are their ancestors' wildest dreams. We cannot have an honest discussion about the advancement of women while ignoring the state of the world which we live in. This is the lens I think we should look at gender equality. So how do we take into consideration the fully realized experience of women and make sure that we can still succeed in the workplace? We need an approach that doesn't allow but enable our success. The United Nations has recognized gender equality as a fundamental human right. They further contend that women are entitled to live with dignity and with freedom from want and fear from and want and from fear. Gender equality is also a precondition for advancing development and reducing poverty. Empowered women contribute to the health and productivity of whole families and communities, and they improve prospects for the next generation. Despite solid evidence demonstrating the centrality of women's empowerment to realizing human rights, reducing poverty, promoting development and addressing the world's most urgent challenges, gender equality remains an unfulfilled promise and this needs continued commitment to be addressed. When looking at gender equality as a starting point, it is important for us to briefly explore the distinction between equality and equity as it relates to gender. Equity and equality are terms often used interchangeably and the purpose of each can be lost. So let's try to understand why each of these functions are equally important. While equity can be described as giving everyone what they need to be successful, equality seeks to treat everyone the same. As an example, equality is giving everyone a shoe, but equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. Laura Turquette and Sandrine Kwesi, who are part of the United Nations Women Organization, have published an online report that looked at the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on gender. The report showed that apart from the adverse impact that is caused by excluding women from being able to participate in the economy and setting barriers to their participation, there are additional challenges and obstacles that women need to contend with as they fight for gender equality, um, which we have briefly discussed in, my, discussed in my opening, such as economic exclusion, pay parities, and femicide, just to name a few. With this approach in mind, um, we need to tackle the issues that, um, that are pervasive in relation to, to women. And in doing this, I think we actually need to explore what the paradigm shift is that we actually need to, need to make. The process of fairness that equality aims to, provoke, to promote can only work if everyone works from the same place and needs the same help. Equity is one of the key levers required to achieve gender equality because it can actively move everyone closer to success by leveling the current playing field. The reality the world over is that men currently hold the majority of key decision-making roles. And if we hope to change this, it is going to be important for us to intentionally look at how we can level the playing field across all sectors in order to address the current barriers of entry that women have have continued to contend with for me, for, with regards to many industries. And it goes without saying that despite their differences, our differences are unique and it would be a futile exercise to attempt to box this into one definition that would define the success, that would define what success would look like. The intention is to rather honor our respective differences as men and women, instead of treating them as obstacles when it comes to gender equality. Our route to attaining gender equality will require concerted effort to fix the current system, policies and regulations which have been in place for decades and have played a contributing role and barrier to attaining gender equality. Women are not the problem, the system is. 
we would be hard, it would be hard pressed to believe that it would be possible to attain gender equality in the workplace without addressing the pervasive issues and challenges that continue to hamper the attainment of gender equality in society. And before I unpack the varying aspects of what this would entail, I would like to share an extract from a book titled How Women Encounter Technology, written by Mitta and Robertson. Gender stereotyping on the part of parents, educators, religion, the media, and society at large encourage the impression that certain jobs are exclusively for men. Often, it is the economic, social, and political structures which keep women in low paid and low status work. Women's double shift at home and at work undoubtedly affects their professional progress. In Africa, the home shift may, in many cases, include caring for parents, indoors, younger siblings, and in addition, women often have to work twice as hard to prove to men that they are also capable of doing their jobs well. The role of women is often taken for granted. Essential activities would come to a standstill but for their participation. And while this book may have been published in 1995, Unfortunately, most of what the authors have said still holds true 15 years later. As an example, when looking at the healthcare industry from an African perspective, according to the World Health Organization, women make up 65% of, of nurses, while men make up the majority of physician roles. This picture doesn't look right. How has society left women behind? we actually need to look at this at a deeper level in order to understand the, the pervasive issues that currently exist. When we, start, when we start to bring this closer to home, a large share of women's employment within South Africa is in the informal sector as a result of hundreds of years of systemic and structural exclusion of which we are all aware of. Unfortunately, jobs within the informal um, economy more often than not lack labor rights social protection, access to healthcare benefits, sick leave, as well as unemployment benefits. And these are just a few aspects to this problem. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that we had to shut down the majority of a number of industries, which has had an adverse impact on our economy. And as you know, South Africa is a, was already contending with sluggish growth. I know that I'm probably being generous by describing the South African economy as sluggish. But as I said in the beginning, I am an optimist at heart. The image that we are looking at right now is an image that stood out for me of Mama Tandi Tabete from Dobsonville Soweto, an area which I call home because that's where I grew up. And to this day, that remains my mama's house and home for me. Mama Tandi was arrested for trying to sell Acha without a permit. And she was subsequently um, arrested as a result of this transgression. When asked about this after her release, she said, I was not resisting arrest. I knew I was in the wrong because I did not have a permit. I was not fighting the police when they put me inside the van. The only issue I had was being treated like I had killed someone. There was no need for the handcuffs. I tried to explain, but they did not want to hear my side of the story, she said. I know this may sound like shade, and it is. But how incredible would it be if police officers and government institutions would prioritize and investigate the swift prosecution of real criminals and perpetrators who kill women and children on a daily basis? I'm not justifying what Mamba Tandi did, but I'm saying that I understand. And in the words of Audrey Lorde, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even if her shackles are very different from my own. What was she to do? Desperate to feed herself and her children, what was she to do? How do we transform the sector and provide security for people like Mama Tandi? Her right to earn money to sustain her livelihood was revoked as a result of the lockdown. What do you do as a parent when the cupboards are empty and your children haven't had food in days? It's all good and well to put regulations in place, which were necessary at the time. But unfortunately, the lockdown period had the most adverse impact on the informal sector and industries such as retail, hospitality and tourism, which are industries dominated by women. Women within the informal sector and these sectors have been deprived of the ability to support themselves economically. Widespread job losses within these industries, which are happening as we speak, will in no doubt have long-term impacts for women's economic independence and security. From a corporate sector, as a woman who's part of this formal sector of our economy, 
and very much alive to the challenges and obstacles that we are faced with on a daily basis, which are equally critical and require urgent attention. But what continues to be painfully clear is that by virtue of the fact that the majority of us are concentrated in the informal sector, it is imperative to prioritize the societal issues at play that continue to hinder our progress when it comes to gender equality. We need to fix the system, a system that is with intent designed to exclude women using legislation enacted by men, company policies written from a male perspective, purposefully unsafe environments that endanger women because we are not the problem. However, in order to be able to fix the system, we need to urgently look at addressing and curbing the current fem femicide pandemic, which we are faced with. There's no point in placing priority on issues we face in the formal sector if we may not be alive tomorrow to reap the benefits of gender equality. The critical priority is our fight for survival help us stay alive. We know what the problems are and we've known for many years. We, women across the world are hard at work driving this change. So what is our call to action? The roles that men and women play in society are not biologically determined. They are socially determined. And while they may be justified as being required by cultural religion, these roles vary widely by locality and evolve over time. Efforts to promote women's empowerment should ensure that while cultural considerations are respected, the rights of women and children are not ignored and seen as secondary in the process. Women's rights have to be upheld and protected. Promoting gender equality also requires the recognition that women are diverse in their roles and the roles that they play, and no one role is less important than the other. While we may be diverse in age, social status, physical ability, geographic location and educational levels, the fabric of our lives and the choices that we are faced with on a daily basis will vary widely depending on our respective circumstances. Addressing gender equality and women's empowerment will require strategic interventions at all levels of government and the private sector. And this is inclusive of policy making in order to prioritize and address the following critical issues. When we look at reproductive health, in the words of Margaret Sanger, no woman can call herself free who does not control her own body. The ability of women to control their own fertility is fundamental to women's empowerment and equality. When a woman can, pl can plan her family, she can plan the rest of her life. Protecting and promoting our reproductive rights, including the right to decide on whether or not we want to have children, is essential to ensuring our freedom to participate more fully and equally in society. Unfortunately, by simply being a woman, we are more vulnerable than men to reproductive health problems, and the failure to provide information, services, and adequate healthcare facilities to protect our reproductive health we again face gender-based discrimination and a violation of our rights to health and life. In relation to economic empowerment, the majority of the world's poorest people are women. We are the face of poverty. Economic dispar disparities persist partly because much of the unpaid work within families and communities falls on the shoulders of women, and women continue to face discrimination as it relates to fair economic participation. In relation to education, Dr. James Amen Agree stated that if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a whole nation. And I agree with this statement. According to the United Nations, about two thirds of the world's illiterate adults are women. A lack of education severely restricts a woman's access to information and opportunities. Conversely, Increasing access to educational opportunities will, will yield benefits, not just for women, but for future generations as well. Higher levels of education are strongly associated with lower infant mortality and lower fertility, as well as better outcomes for our children. If we look at the political landscape, gender no, Monday, equality... No, Monday, sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to please... Um, yes, I'm almost done, V. Actually, I was okay. concluding. So don't worry, I'm, almost, I'm wrapping up. Um, gender equality cannot be achieved without the backing and enforcement of institutions, 
but too many social and legal institutions do not guarantee women e equality in basic legal and human rights, in access to or control of resources in their employment or earnings. We are capable, we are powerful, we are doers and we are visionaries. We have immense potential, but to truly harness it, we need fertile ground. We need to be alive for that moment. Despite many international agreements affirming our human rights, women and girls are still more likely than men to be poor and illiterate. Gender equality demands the empowerment of women with a focus on identifying and readdressing power imbalances and giving women more autonomy to manage their lives. When women are empowered, whole families are empowered. Let's do the work for the for who let's do the work for whose names we forget, those who were not fully able to realize their potential, for whose light we turned off before time. It's for them that we need the workplace environment to be welcoming. And as final and as final concluding thoughts to this point, for as long as the law continues to bless me with the privilege of waking up each day, and until I take my last breath in honor of the women who have come before me and the generations of women who will be born decades from now, I intend on working towards the attainment of gender equality across all levels of society. However, in order for me to be able to do this, my plea is to the humanity of all of the men in our society, in order for me and all of the women in our country to have the audacity to aspire towards this bold ambition of achieving gender equality in our lifetime, we need you to work with us as we continue to fight for our survival. Help us stay alive. Our lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Nomande. Some really, uh, wow, some, some really good, not just food for thought, but I think it's very important to note that, you know, these are real challenges that we face, not just on a global stage, but in South Africa in particular. So, Thank you for bringing to bear the challenges, but also for giving us sight of the many opportunities for all of us to be able to be instrumental in making a change as we move forward. I, I'm really disappointed that we don't have the time to, to have more dialogue on that, but we will pick it up. So I'm very aware that we're really running out of time. Time is very tight. Uh, so uh, we're going to switch over to Professor Tuli Modoncella. Tuli really does not need any introduction, uh, especially from a South African and, and even from a global stage perspective. She is a national treasure, uh, as I say to uh, everybody. But she has been a lifelong activist on social justice, uh, human rights, governance, and many other areas. She was named as Times most influential people in the world and also Forbes Africa person of the year in 2016. She is one of the drafters of South Africa's constitution uh, and a co-architect of several laws uh, that many of us engage with that have sought to anchor our democracy and make it strong. She has a global reputation for integrity um, and you know she's really a strong advocate for many initiatives that highlight the importance of social justice uh, looking at inclusivity uh, and enjoying the fruits of democracy from an inclusive perspective. And also, she's very passionate about the pursuit of peace. Um, our Professor Tuli Madoncella will be speaking to us on access to the rule of law, uh, looking at the concept of what social justice is, and in particular, social justice, social justice in the South African landscape post-COVID-19. So, Professor Mertensela, let's hand it over to you to take us home. Thank you for this privilege, Access Nexus. Thank you for laying out a platform for us to discuss the rule of law and access to justice. It is a World Justice Forum that constantly reminds us that as long as the the rule of law is left to lawyers and judges. The sustainability of the rule of law and consequently democracy and peace are at stake. This morning I would like to engage you very briefly about access to justice as an incident of the rule of law. Dalla Alma, 
then Minister of Justice or the first Minister of Justice in democratic South Africa believed that access to justice is essential for the rule of law. He also believed that access to justice transcends access to institutions and mechanisms for dispute resolution and vindication of rights. It also includes the right to understand and to be understood. We tend to think of justice as blind. The symbol of Lady Justice or the symbol of justice globally is Lady Justice a blind woman with scales in one hand, rather a blindfolded woman with scales in one hand and a sword in another. We have to ask ourselves whether this symbol of justice remains valid. I've listened to the colleagues, the colleagues from LexisNexis, the colleague from Anglo-American, Jonathan Hawke, and the last colleague, Nomonde White. The running thread there is the importance of the law, understanding and embracing the humanity of every person and, re and responding fairly to every human being. Can a blind lady justice do that? Also, given the fact that the notion of justice as a blind lady was created in Roman times and Greek times when slaves were not regarded as worthy of justice, women were not regarded as worthy of justice. It was justice among the equals, but the equals were only regarded as men with means. But I want to leave it at that and say, in this conversation and in the conversation where I am at the Social Justice Chair at Stellenbosch University and the Tuma Foundation for Democracy, Leadership and Literacy, we see access to justice as an incidence of the rule of law. The colleague from LexisNexis has already informed us what LexisNexis regards as the key pillars of the rule of law. And these are equality under the law, transparency of law, independent judiciary and accessible legal remedies. This is not entirely different from the rule of law understanding we use in the world justice project and the World Justice Forum, where we believe that the rule of law, at the core of the rule of law, is accountability, just laws, open government, which includes uh, accessible services, and lastly, accessible justice dispensed by independent judges, lawyers, and other institutions. Namonde mentioned the case of Tandi Tabete. When justice fails, what happens? COVID-19 regulations respond to a global health pandemic. It has been said that COVID-19 has given us a new set of lenses to see the reality that has always been around us. And part of that reality is inequality. And part of that inequality, or a lot of that inequality, is structural. And a lot of it has to do with injustices of the past. It is a shadow of the past that continues to impact on lives. The fact that certain lives are not valued, the fact that certain people can be arrested, just like that. But more importantly, Let's go back to the rule of law. The Constitutional, case, the, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, in the case of Bidika 231 CC, 
and others versus trustees, it is a long case, said the following, I quote, the rule of law requires that the law be clear and accessible. The law must indicate with reasonable certainty to those who are bound by it what is required of them so that they may regulate their conduct accordingly. Can it be said that Tandi Tabete understood what the law was? What would have helped for Tandi Tabete to understand what the law was? It boils down to the formula for the rule of law that LexisNexis talks about and the World Justice Forum talks about. The laws must be clear. The laws must be formulated in a manner that is inclusive. The laws must be formulated transparently and the laws must be reasonable. We thank governments all over the world for elaborating these regulations that have made sure that we contain the virus. However, in many of these countries, there hasn't been adequate understanding that some of the people in society live in the margins and that those who are in the margins of society are going to be impacted more adversely by any law despite good intentions. And Judge Davis in the DBA case says, it then becomes the duty of government to think more clearly before it comes up with any law or regulation. How will this law advance human rights? And how might this law impact negatively or adversely on human rights? And if this law is going to impact adversely on human rights, are there alternative ways of achieving the purpose we're trying to achieve, which means might be less intrusive? This is a requirement under South Africa's constitutional framework, but that's a requirement that is supposed to apply in every country that subscribes to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For me personally, the case of Tandi Tabete hit home in a very personal way because my mother was arrested when I was six during apartheid. She was arrested for trading without a license because government would not give her that license. And I remember that I was left with a, a child at that age. Um, in fact, I wasn't six, I was four. I was left with a baby in the house to look after that baby until much later in the afternoon that relatives came over to, to help us. Now, people are being arrested left, right and center. But one thing for certain is that the majority of the people that have been arrested are black and working class people. We talk about the intersection of class and race. And part of it has to do with the fact that they don't even understand these regulations. But secondly, these regulations are so intrusive into their ability to live a normal life, such that it's impossible to comply with some of these regulations. And in the case of Tandi Tabete, she, she tells us in a video that I would ask you to check on the internet, she tells us that she couldn't just sit whilst her children are starving. But let me go to the next thing around what happens though when the edifice is not holding. Is the edifice holding? I'm glad that in South Africa, the edifice is holding currently, primarily because we have a great constitution. And globally, most countries, the edifice is holding. However, we have to be careful about leaving too many people behind. Hence, the UN has invited us to use sustainable development goals as an agenda for change to make sure that those that we have left behind are included in the fruits of democracy. And SDG 16, which is about the rule of law, peace and strong institutions is what this LexisNexis dialogue on the rule of law 
is about. And it's also uh, what the World Justice Forum seeks to achieve when it encourages all of us to join hands to make sure that justice is accessible to everyone. And as I've indicated, it's not just ability to go to court, it's making sure that the courts are just, it's making sure that the people who administer the law understand everyone and make sure that they embrace the humanity of everyone and that they interpret the law in such a manner. At the social justice chair, we're creating instruments, one of them being the social impact assessment matrix to help judges and government to leverage data analytics to make sure that they understand before they make a decision how this decision is likely to impact on differently situated people. This is important because as long as there's injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anyway. My next slide about the, 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 the edifice holding is a slide that talks to the shadow of the past. I would ask you during your own time to read the case Minister of Finance and others versus Van Heerden. Uh, Kada Asmal, the late Kada Asmal said in 1994 about South Africa, which applies globally. Most, but not all apartheid legislation has been repealed. The effects of apartheid, however, will remain with us for some time still, and even longer if appropriate remedial action is not taken by an elected democratic government. This applies in America, hence we have the Black, Life, the Black Lives Matter movement. This applies in the UK, hence we have the Roads Must Fall movement here in South Africa. It applies globally because I see past injustices as similar to a case where you have a monopoly game and everyone is invited to play, but then people are divided into two teams. The blue team is allowed to play for as long as possible to build empires on the, cha on, on the monopoly game. And after a while, after several rounds, the pink team is allowed to play without starting the game from square one. And I want to ask you this question. Is that equality when after several rounds, of the blue team playing and having acquired most of the properties, having taken control of the game basically, is it fair to say the pink team can now join? Is that equality? The notion of equality, as I understand it, in our constitution and I think globally, if we take that in America, there's a Greeks versus Duke Power Company case, and in Canada, there's several cases, in the UK, there's several cases. Equality is not similar treatment for everyone. There's no difference today between equality and equity. The notion of equality that we use today is not the Aristotelian notion of equality. It is a notion of equality that embraces the humanity of everyone. And it's not about treating people who are differently situated differently. I mean, it's not about treating people who are situated differently in the same manner. If we are to embrace the humanity of everyone, then we have to see everyone. We have to recognize valid differences that are important for the embracing the humanity of all. For example, to treat a child the same way as you're going to treat a 50-year-old can't be equality. That's what Charlotte McCracken told us many, many years ago. What's in it for you, as Mrs. Makwanyane tells us, what's in it for me and you is that when we advance equality, when we make sure that no one is left behind, two things happen. One, as societies, we advance better because none of our human resources are tied up. In other words, we create a less structurally inefficient environment. Africa, for example, as a continent, is a young continent. More than 70% of African people are young. And the question you would like to ask yourself is, if 50% 
of young people in Africa are unemployed? Is that, ineffic is that efficient for Africa's development? Because you have 50% of your human resources lying idle. So the first reason why it's important to make sure that everyone is unleashed, everyone's potential is unleashed, is for economic efficiency and development. But it's also about social cohesion, which is what the UN has told us. Um, UN Resolution 64 stroke 10 says, social development and social justice are indispensable for the achievement and maintenance of peace and security within and among nations. And true justice has it at its core social justice. There are glimmers of hope though, in terms of going forward. There are many projects that are taking place all over the world. We've listened to the colleagues that are doing amazing things. From our side at the social justice chair, all we plead for is connecting lights to make sure that the impact is more visible and the difference we're making is accelerated. So the examples I can give you in terms of pulling things together, pulling resources together and joining lights is the social justice M plan. One of the key initiatives under the social justice M plan is a data analytics tool for differentiated policy design. We also are in the process of commencing with an everyday justice project, which is important for access to justice. Everyday justice project is about teaching everyone about their rights and responsibilities and teaching everyone about other people's rights and responsibilities. This will ensure that on an everyday basis, the majority of people do not violate other people's rights. It also will ensure that on an everyday basis, people know what to do when their rights are violated. And there are other private initiatives. And there's one private initiative that I would like to mention um, uh, that struck me, country duty. When Mam Tandi was arrested, the court wanted a bail of a thousand rand. This is a person who's selling archer because they have nothing. You want a thousand rand from her. And thank God to Tumi Sold and other young people under country duty, they stepped in to help. And what does it say to me about access to justice? It is my understanding that for there to be access to justice, we all have to join hands to make sure that everyone knows what their rights are. Everyone knows what other people's rights are and therefore what their responsibility is in making sure that those rights are not violated. But those of us who are privileged enough to help others step up and help when we see rights being violated. And more importantly, that corporate, the corporate world, all over the world, joins hands to make sure that it creates an environment where the rule of law thrives. And one of the ways of making sure the rule of law thrives is making sure that the laws are just and the laws are justly enforced. At this stage, I would like to thank LexisNexis for providing this kind of platform and for working with the social justice chair at Stellenbosch University as we play our part in advancing justice with an emphasis on social justice. And one of the areas of assistance we were provided with by LexisNexis was the funding of a trip we undertook to the top of Mount Everest. We summited Mount Everest to highlight the importance of high access to, to justice, but more importantly, we summited Kilimanjaro to highlight social justice. Going forward, there is hope for the future. I've mentioned sustainable development goals. One of the colleagues has mentioned the UN Global Compact. All of this is about creating a united front 
to make sure that no one is left behind. SDG 16 is clearly about access to justice, the rule of law, just laws, and strong institutions. What I would like to say, though, is what we were told in 1993 in Vienna, when the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights was adopted, that human rights are in, indivisible and interconnected. If we are to advance access to justice, we also have to play our part in eliminating poverty, hunger, and inequality. The truth is, among us all and between us, there is an invincible power to write the next chapter regarding justice for all and sustainable peace. Accordingly, the power to write the next chapter regarding justice for all and sustainable peace lies in our collective hands. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you, Professor Madensella. Always very inspiring to listen to your learnings, your experience, and also the, the inspiration that you give uh, to this generation and the following generations that come in terms of how we create a future where everybody has access to not just the rule of law, to, but to whatever they need uh, to be able to achieve their potential is always heartwarming. So thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we have run way over time, but um, I think I would like to firstly thank all our speakers for their amazing words of inspiration, uh, for educating us, for planting seeds that we will now go and nurture around, you know, what can we do to move this forward as a movement. Um, and once again, I would really welcome everybody to reach out to us. As I said before, we're looking for like-minded companies and people to partner with uh, to be able to advance the rule of law on the continent. Um, we were unfortunately not able to get to the Q&A session, so I'd like to urge you to please send your comments or questions to webinars at lexisnexus.co.za. We have been asked if a recording will be made available. Yes, a recording will be made available to all attendees. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to say goodbye in the manner that we would have liked to. But thank you to all our attendees for joining us. Uh, and once again, thank you to all our guests and our speakers. Uh, let's move Africa forward. Uh, there's a saying that I'm probably going to, to, to not say in it, in, in it correctly, but there is a saying that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. Um, and if you want to go far, you go together. So we would really like to go far in terms of changing the landscape of Africa. So please join us on this journey. And thank you very much to everyone who attended and to all our speakers again. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>